Hi, I'm Dave Lawrence from the California Type Foundry. Font Lab 7 is my favorite font editor because of all the powerful features, everything that it can do. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you how to use some of those powerful features to make great fonts in Font Lab 7. Hi, this is Dave Lawrence from the California Type Foundry. I'm glad that you're here with me today. I am doing some videos for Font Lab, and this is going to help you um, avoid some some uh, costly mistakes when you are making using Elements. So Elements can be a great tool, as I've shown in a previous video. You can just resize. See, watch if I want to just resize the way that this is. Let me get into the correct one, and then move this up. I can change all my elements at the same time. So that is just such a huge time saver. Um, <clears throat> if you make a mistake on the serifs, it's like, okay, it prints, you print it out and then this is, doesn't look right or something. You can just quickly you know, go in, make a couple of tweaks, change in a couple of minutes, print a new test file, see how it is. So, th so that type of workflow, instead of, what I was doing before when I was not using components or elements or anything like that for my serifs was like change every single one. So I had to want to make sure to get it correct the first time. It was just sort of stressful. So there are some things that you need to know about elements. And you can notice that I have my, my grid is a little bit weird right here. If you take a look at this, see, I have, okay. So with elements, your vertical positioning is of your nodes is really critical um, more so. And, and that's because you're going to be slanting this. You're going to be slanting some of this at, at some point in time. And in order to get its the elements to line up when they're slanted and then rounding is being applied, you have to have them line up at the right positions on it. Okay, so let me just give you an example here. So say if I do an angle that is not really um okay so so let me let me just get this one let me put this to just like whatever and and then I'm going to put my coordinates I'm going to I'm previewing rounding okay I'm going to go to this one I'm going to go to slant I'm just going to slant it by like 10 degrees or something okay so let so so look what happened See, this guy is poking out. That guy is poking out. This guy is poking out a little bit. And stuff is just sort of poking out, poking out up here. And you are going to slant some at some point in time. Even if you're going to make an italic to go with this, you're still probably going to slant this first, your elements, to then get the italic and then adjust the outstrokes and instrokes over there. So... So that's going to be important. So the, so now I want to show you if I put that back to where he's supposed to be, and then if I go back to my actions and I use an actual good 11.31, uh, and, and we'll talk about what is a good slant angle. Now I'm going to push that and watch. See, nothing. Nothing should, well, as long as I did it right. See, no, nothing is poking out. I have all this. This is a complicated symbol with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven elements. And, and I slanted it. There's not one single rounding error where things are poking out. And that's because I chose the, the correct angle with the correct grid size. So let me show you a spreadsheet that I had made to sort of help me figure that out. Well, okay, that's my multiplication tables to help you to help with that. Okay. So large divisors list. When you're trying to calculate the slope and you want things that precisely slant like that, you have to use these angles that are a little bit like this. And the reason is from trigonometry. When you have a simple slope, like, okay, so, so for example, let me go up here. Here is a slope of one to five. That means you, you go up by five and then you go down and then you go over to the right by one. That's that actually gives you a complicated slope of eleven point three zero nine nine three two four seven 
you have to take the arc tangent, which is the inverse tangent function of the sides, and then that gives you the right angle for this thing here. So that's what I did in my formulas. If we just go into my formulas, I take the degrees, you take the arc tan, a tan of this divided by this. So you have to take it of this by this, which is 0.2, and it gives you 11.31 degrees approximately. Okay, so these are the good angles. And what's great about this, what I love about this spreadsheet is because if you want a, a very precise, I just go up to my cells, I go, I, I say what type of specificity, I say I want it to seven decimal places. I go, so I copy that thing, and then I go to slant, and I type in that whole thing here, and now I have a very precise slant here, and I push okay. And now that should be even more precise. Let me see how precise it is. Um, when, when you do it really precise like that, and you go up to coordinates, I uh, turn off preview rounding, and I go over this. It's, it, it's exactly at 311, 570. Um, this goes to the nearest hundredths of a unit. So this is down to the, even below the hundredths unit, even the thousandths, this is an accurate positioning of these things. Okay, then uh, for the elements panel, a font lab is gonna show you to the hundredths place on the degrees. Okay, so this is what you do. If you want to use these angles of um, 21 degrees approximately, 19, 16.7, 4.03, 11.3, 8.5, and all those ones, you have to have your grid at a 20 and all your nodes have to be at that 20 positioning. So how you go and change that is you go to com command uh, and then comma, and you're gonna click on grid. There we are. And this, I just put the horizontals for this part don't matter that much. I'll, I'll actually go in and change my grid of a fair amount during the uh, process of, of, my, of my workflow. But here I just wanted something that was out of the way, you know, a number that made sense. And so I just put a hundred there. Uh, you could do it by 50 or whatever you want. And then you put there by 20. Okay, so I push apply, hit it that. Okay, and you can see how some of these things are not at good slope for, like you could not slant this by those 20s there. Okay, so because I'm using a 15, uh, a 15 unit grid, which is every 15. So if I go back to my file, you can see I go, go over. So d this only has by 5, 10, and 20. So I use 15 because I actually like the slants of that one quite a bit. And also since it's divisible by 5, the numbers don't re look really crazy. So the it, it sort of makes sense somewhat because then you can get a perfectly 3.8, 7.6, 11.31, 14.93. Those can be just about perfect with elements if you're doing that. You can also get a, a, a 18, which is quite a bit at that point in time, okay? So now you sort of have to decide, okay, which angle do you like? So thinking about your italic, well, well, what node um, positioning do you want to work with and what angles do you want? So I sort of chose that I like this 11.31 angle. It's pretty good. It was used for um, FF DIN, uh, font, font DIN. So that, that one's pretty nice. Uh, multiplication table. So you can see here, and obviously the 20s give you the, sort of the nicest numbers here. But a problem with the 20s, it doesn't give you that many numbers. 48 different positions from about to the top, about to a thousand. I put this about 960 because that's about how much you'll use. So that is where you have to have your, your uh, node position. But look at 15. That gives me the smaller number you have, the less italic angles you're going to get. But the more node positions you're going to have that, can, that uh, you can use. This one's going to give me 64. So that's increased by about a third. So... Um, that is not too shabby. That's pretty good. That's why I went with that one. Okay, and plus I sort of like the numbers. So I didn't want to choose something like 19 or, or 13 because look at that. How am I going to remember all these things? 
I mean, you're going to have your grid there so you can see if it's aligned with the grid, but how are you going to remember? You really have to get to know your 13's multiplication tables. And since angles look pretty similar, there's not, to me, there may not be that much difference between some of these and these. They're, they're off. They're different by about a uh, point, by a half a degree, um, except this one here. That's, that's quite a bit more. A degree, half a degree, stuff like that. So, so see, you, you're, uh, you have the, to weigh some of these things out of, of which one you want to use. Okay. So which points, you don't need to have every point aligned with this grid because that would be too prohibitive. There's certain points that I've identified and, and I call those structural nodes. And those are the nodes that sort of line up with any, where one element is lining up with another element. Okay, so if I have, okay, so a couple of things here. Part of the reason why I have this, this part on top is not 100% necessary because I could easily have go like this and then this could be anywhere, but maybe put it at 80 degrees. So I could have done like that, but I liked having that up there because when my element is like a little bit off, it's really easy to see because I can see a big, a big line of oh, okay that's that's not matching up see if i pull it there you can see where it's where it's lined up okay these are structural nodes these parts where the serifs connect if there's a bracket if it just goes straight off then there's no real structural node you can put the um you will get rounding errors but you can put the the node inside more if you don't care about like your stems being a one a unit or two units different on the top from on the bottom, then maybe it doesn't make a difference to you. But um, this part here, that's a structural node. That needs to be right. This one, it's, it's actually good if you do these handles and you can see that I did it here. Um, you don't want to reharmonize stuff once you got that. Here on this side, actually, I didn't do it. So there I have it. There's lined up. That's a structural. These, this one is not structural, but since he's just part of the thing that needs it like that, this one is not structural because he's sort of slanted anyway. Um, he will, if if we want him, it is it's possible that um, when on one of our instances that it might export like this, where it's off by. Well, it this would already have been combined, but this part might be off. Um, so it, it might cause that to be off on one of our slanted things, but it wouldn't actually, there would be nothing poking out if this was off like that. Also the tops, because just your overshoots, you can use whatever nodes look good because those you don't need to have exactly perfect. Uh, those are not structural nodes because they're not connecting with another element. Um, I suppose if, if you had, I don't know, I suppose if you had some other straight part of your overshoot, or something, it was connected in some way. I, I, I need to think about that. But usually that's not gonna be part of that. You can see with um, these, I put some slight overshoot that's in between. I did put my overshoot uh, number at 15 to just to be sort of in line with my grid here. Okay, so I think that that, that is a pretty good starting point of what to do with your elements. So follow the grid, um, you know, figure out what type of angles you want, uh, and then get your grid, your vertical positions on your grid aligned like that. You can always pause the video, take a look at the, at the numbers that I have there about what is going to help you the most when you're making elements. But then when you, when you use elements, you get the benefit of all this stuff of when you can move this up and down and you can change a hundred things at once with just one, a couple clicks. Okay. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for watching and ha good luck with making your fonts.